Welcome back to Carib 21 where we share what's trending in and around the Caribbean. If it's your first time joining, please feel free to like, share and subscribe for more amazing content. In today's video, I would like to talk about Jamaica's representation on the international stage at the United Nations General Assembly last week. I believe that the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Kamina Johnson-Smith, I believe that she carried herself very well. She represented herself very well on the international stage for Jamaica, the way how she articulated herself and all of that. It was excellent. However, I believe that the talking point was very weak. I believe that in a time when we see what is going on around the world, when we look at what is going on with our next door neighbors, with Cuba, with Haiti, and when we see what is going on in the Middle East, I just believe that out of all the, the representation from the Caribbean, in particular, the, the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, when I was watching her presentation, she looked very passionate and she looked like, yes, if, if I'm from Haiti and she's standing up there talking about what is going on in Haiti and, and, and that the world needs to step in, she's believable. But when I was watching the presentation from the Foreign Minister of Jamaica, it looked like something was scripted and they're just there as talking points. So because of that, I believe that it was a weak presentation when you compare it to the, the presentation from, from Barbados and from Trinidad. Another thing that stood out to me about the foreign minister's presentation, the presentation was about 19 minutes, close to 20 minutes, and she mentioned Jamaica about a hundred times. You know, that was the difference between her presentation and what we saw from the Prime Minister of Barbados. So what I would like to do, I'd like us to, to go through a bit of high points in her presentation and I'll break it down right after this. We, the member states of the United Nations, are all facing the same world of multiple and intersecting challenges. The great difference between us, however, is our capacity to meet, withstand and recover from the shocks they bring. If there is one realization that we must share, it is that these challenges cannot be solved alone. They can only be addressed through multilateralism, diplomacy, and international cooperation. Mr. President, Jamaica is a small island located in the second most climate vulnerable region in the world. We emerged from a brutal history of slavery and colonization, effect, achieving political independence a mere 62 years ago. Until recently, most of our independent history has been characterized by high levels of poverty, debt, and unemployment. But as we chart a course towards sustainable prosperity, we are determined that these characteristics will not define the Jamaica we bequeath to future generations. Against the odds, Jamaica has been building our resilience. Our macroeconomic fundamentals today are stronger than they have been at any time over the past 50 years. Our credit ratings have been upgraded by international rating agencies and our fiscal credibility has improved. Jamaica is now an attractive destination for investment. Over the last 10 years, in spite of the pandemic, we have more than halved our debt to GDP ratio, significantly reduced our poverty rate, brought unemployment to historic lows, and increased our minimum wage by more than 100%. Our management of the economy has created fiscal space that has allowed us to invest more into social welfare, national security, health, and education. Through our national broadband network project, we have increased internet penetration to 77% and internet user penetration to 85.1%. We're closing our domestic digital divide providing more and better services online. We've also embarked on Jamaica's largest ever expansion and upgrade of infrastructure, using a mixture of pure budgetary financing and public-private partnerships. Mr. President, these advancements have been hard won. Our effort has required social, political, and international partnership, measured policy, and strategic management. Even as we acknowledge the sacrifices made to enable our achievements, we recognize that many of our successes can be easily eroded by exogenous shocks, including climate change, 
which we view as a clear and present danger to humanity. As a small island developing state, Jamaica is severely affected by higher temperatures, warmer seas, sea level rise, and the increased intensity and frequency of natural disasters. Hurricane Beryl, which impacted the Caribbean in July this year, was the earliest Category 5 hurricane on record. Beryl resulted in the dislocation of families and communities, along with significant damage to infrastructure, houses, schools, and farms. Dam damage was more severe in our agricultural belt, wiping out crops, killing livestock, and triggering knock-on effects on higher food prices and inflation. Our new climate smart agricultural practices were no match for the hurricane. Her winds took the panels for solar-powered irrigation pumps and flattened 70% of our greenhouses. We experience almost a half of every year in the uncertainty of a hurricane season. Natural and climate-based disasters continue to set back efforts to attain the SDGs and realize sustained inclusive growth and development. We have therefore sought to strengthen our ability to respond to and recover from such disasters through a risk-layered approach to disaster response financing. Jamaica, therefore, has significantly increased resources to our contingency fund and the National Natural Disaster Reserve Fund. We have established the National Disaster Fund triggered by measured impact on GDP and become the first small island developing state to independently sponsor a catastrophe bond. Additionally, we participate in the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. These mechanisms, however, Mr. President, do not reduce the occurrence of disasters, nor prevent the disruption, dislocation, and destruction that they cause. It bears repeating that no country can combat the effects of climate change on its own. Jamaica, therefore, affirms our unwavering commitment to international cooperation to counter the negative impacts of climate change and to the pursuit of climate justice. We urge the major polluting nations to honor their commitments under the Paris Agreement and to meet their finance obligations. Furthermore, we welcome the adoption of the Antigua and Barbuda Agenda for SIDS, the ABBAS, at the fourth international conference on small island developing states. More particularly, Jamaica endorses the call for a redoubling of international cooperation and action to accelerate mitigation and adaptation. All countries must maintain the target of limiting global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius through enhanced NDCs based on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. Allow me to pause here to congratulate the government of Antigua and Barbuda for successfully hosting the conference. Jamaica calls on the UN and the international financial institutions to adopt a new climate finance goal at COP29. We further call for urgent and accelerated mobilization of international action and resources. This includes the full and effective operationalization of the loss and damage fund to address issues of responsiveness and scale that are most critical okay, for SIDS. So climate change. Climate change. I, I'm having a problem with climate change. I, I, I don't know if it's just me or, or others are seeing it, but I'm, I'm really having a problem because on one hand, we talk about taking care of our earth and we know that there are things that in Jamaica, we can do in Jamaica. We know that the way we dump garbage, we know that the plastic, the way we dispose plastic and, and we don't have fish eating plastics and, and stuff like that. We know when you go to the beach and, and, and you take your garbage and you dispose it, all of that is good. But when you talk about climate change in small island nations, it just doesn't make sense when the, the cruise industry is getting bigger and bigger every year. When you have these massive ships that's going to the Caribbean every year and we see the impact in terms of emissions that larger country like China, like the United States have, what control do we really have over climate change and how it just feels to me like the small man is paying for climate change, but still the big companies are still able to keep growing with the cruise ship and stuff like that. So this is what I'm not getting. When you see like ships, some of the, the, the new ships that are coming out 
and they are heading to the Caribbean, these mega ships that are big enough than some of the ships own more people on them than the population of say like St. Kitts and Nevis and that is what I'm not getting with the climate change. Tell me what do you think? Sound off in the comments section. Mr. President, the SDGs were adopted by leaders as a universal clarion call to tackle poverty, ensure peace and promote prosperity. Jamaica shares the concern that globally only 17% of the SDG targets are on track. We are proud that our progress is further along domestically and we fully support and are honored to co-lead the Secretary General's SDG Stimulus Leaders Group. International cooperation is urgently needed to drive sustained efforts to tackle structural and systemic issues that contain access to development finance. Through our collective advocacy, we aim to elevate the global agenda to ensure that no one is left behind. We call upon wealthier countries and the IFIs to partner with developing countries and to redouble their efforts to create and implement innovative strategies to unlock financing and spur investments towards attaining the SDGs. The upcoming fourth International Conference on Financing for Development presents an opportunity to commit to tangible deliverables to address the current financing challenges. These include impactful, practical, and meaningful reform of the international financial architecture, to strengthen the voice and representation of developing countries in international decision-making, and to substantially improve the quantity, accessibility, and affordability of financing for development. Mr. President, this brings me to the Summit of the Future. The adoption of the Pact for the Future, the Declaration on Future Generations, and the Global Digital Compact signaled renewed hope in multilateralism. The consensus demonstrated by our collective resolve to deliver inclusive and durable solutions to current and emerging global challenges brings new hope. With foresight, political will, and joint action, we can deliver a better world for future generations. Jamaica commends the work of Namibia and Germany in their facilitation of the pact and we were honored to have co-facilitated, together with the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the Declaration on Future Generations. Mr. President, Jamaica believes that in, in leveraging multilateralism to advance sustainable development, human rights, and international peace and security to deliver results for all the peoples of the world. No country or region should be excluded from the opportunities to attain the SDGs. Jamaica, therefore, joins the call for the discontinuation of the crippling economic, commercial, and financial embargo against our closest Caribbean neighbor, Cuba. We further call for a cessation of the classification of Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism. These measures continue to have a devastating impact on the economic and social well-being of the people of Cuba and preclude progress towards their attainment of the SDGs. Mr. President, Jamaica also once again condemns the brutal October 7 attacks in Israel and the devastating attacks in the Palestinian territories. The undeniable human crisis and instability compel all parties to resolve the conflict through dialogue and diplomacy. We commend the United States, Qatar, Jordan, Egypt, and others who are making concerted efforts towards a peaceful resolution. We continue to support the United Nations Security Council Resolution 242 and believe that a two-state solution is the best way to achieve lasting peace between Israel and Palestine. It is in this context that Jamaica has recognized the state of Palestine, and we call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and the release of hostages to bring an end to the protracted war and human suffering. Mr. President, much closer to home, Haiti continues to face one of the most challenging periods in its storied history. Rampant gangs are causing chronic instability and unspeakable violence, especially against women and children. Millions of Haitians are facing hunger and dislocation. They need and deserve the unwavering support of the international community to restore peace, security, and democracy, and to address the devastating humanitarian crisis. Jamaica will continue to play its part, including through CARICOM and the Eminent Persons Group, in supporting the political process in Haiti. Significant progress has already been made, particularly since the Kingston talks convened by CARICOM in Jamaica in March of this year. We welcome the installation of the Transitional Presidential Council, 
the appointment of an interim prime minister and ministerial cabinet, and the finalization of the Provisional Electoral Council. The multinational security support mission is critical to the restoration of peace and security in Haiti. We reiterate our gratitude to the government of Kenya for its leadership of and commitment to the MSS. We're pleased to confirm that on the 12th of September, Jamaica deployed its initial command contingent along with Belize as part of the MSS. We are committed to scaling up our numbers. But we also call on the international community to contribute more personnel and equipment. Restoration of peace and security is critical to the creation of an environment in which free and fair elections can be held. The establishment of democratic governance is critical for sustainable economic growth and development for Haiti. Mr. President, since the deployment of the MSS, we have seen improvements in the situation and have reason for cautious optimism. More is needed, however, and time is not on Haiti's side. It is critical that we preserve and advance gains made. It is critical that we maintain hope and stability. We therefore urge the Security Council to renew the mandate of the MSS and to consider future transition to a peacekeeping framework to guarantee funding. We also call for continued and increased support from member states, including financial contributions to the Trust Fund. This is needed for deployment of additional personnel to support the HNP as they recover. Okay, communities. yes, so this part is the part now that is not believable to me. When we talk about what's going on in Cuba, we talk about Haiti, and talk about what's going on in the Middle East. Jamaica just seems to be flip-flopping, especially when it relates to what's going on in Israel. And as, as, as I said earlier, when with Mayor Motley and how she spoke out about what, what is going on in Israel, she was very passionate about it. And she, it's, it's almost like a personal confrontation with the, with the Prime Minister of Israel. And you, see, you, saw, the, you saw pretty much like, like, like a back and forth. I just did not get that passion from Jamaica like they really care much about what was going on there. And that, that is something that I was looking for because Jamaica being the first country in the world that stopped doing business with South Africa because of apartheid, I thought that Jamaica would have a stronger stand of what is going on in the Middle East. And you saw Mia Motley, like, she, she was very strong with her point that the war needs to end and children and women and innocent people are just dying. And when it comes on to Cuba and Haiti, I know that... Jamaica sent um, two dozen members of the, the security force to Haiti, but the presentation just, it wasn't believable to me. It, 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 was, it seemed like they were just going through the motion. It seemed like the American government called them and said, oh, we'll give you such and such money to send. They didn't seem as passionate about it as if they really want to work with Haiti for Haiti to, to, to get to a level where Haiti can really manage itself. And that's the, the, the part that was a bit disappointing to me, but maybe it's just me. Sound off in the comment section and let me know what you think. After watching the highlights from the United General Assembly, did you think that Jamaica represent well? Do you think that they were strong enough talking about our brothers and sisters in Haiti and in Cuba? Let me know what you think. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more amazing content. Peace. I'm out.